Hello and welcome back to this tutorial. In this second part, I'm going to show you how to install your operating system in a virtual machine because you don't want to reboot your machine every time you've made a little change uh, to your kernel, right? Um, so the, uh, the software that you will need now is uh, VirtualBox, the virtual machine, uh, Grub Legacy, and uh, Xor ISO, um, because we are going to create a virtual CD image uh, and uh, make that a bootable CD, and uh, then we will use that as boot medium in the virtual machine. So what we have to do now is um, we will uh, change our make file um, so that we will be able to create mykernel.iso and this depends on mykernel.bin and what we do now is first we create the uh, directory structure of that resulting uh, CD. Okay, so the directory structure will be very similar to what we've worked with so far. So uh, first we will make a, a directory to work in. And that should contain a directory boot. And that di boot directory should contain a grub directory. Okay, so this uh, should look familiar. And um, when we've done that, we will just copy the kernel into this boot directory. Actually, let's just have this. Okay. Um, and now we have to create the uh, grub CFG manually. So um, let's do this. Okay, what is going in there? Um, well, we will have only one entry in there, so... Uh, um, this one entry is supposed to be the default selection. And, um, well, since we only have one entry, it makes no sense to, uh, to wait for some time out until the user has selected something because there is nothing to select really. So uh, set timeout to zero. Okay, and then, then we'll just do what we did before. Um, so menu entry. My operating system then have multi-boot slash boot like uh, then Okay, so when we run this, um, okay, now it has created this ISO directory with subdirectory boot containing our kernel. 
and a directory grub, which contains this grub CFG. Okay, so everything looks like we want it to be. Okay, I'll just uh, delete this again. Um, because now we uh, now we create the CD image from that, and we do that with uh, grub mk rescue output is the target file, and as input we are using this ISO directory. Okay, and. After we've created this image, we don't need this ISO directory anymore, so we can as well just delete it. Okay. So now here we have mykernel.iso. And now let's run this in VirtualBox. So this is what VirtualBox looks like. I'll just create a new virtual machine. Um, well, it's neither a Windows nor a Linux or anything other here, so um, I'll just set this to other operating system and unknown version. Uh, I think 64 megabyte of RAM should be sufficient. We don't need a hard drive right now. Okay, and now the operating system's uh, virtual machine is finished. Now we can just start it and VirtualBox will ask, well, what should I use as boot medium? And then I just uh, uh, select this ISO file and say start. And there is our output, so everything works as we want it to. So I'll close this. And um, I will make another entry in the make file um, called run, which depends on my kernel dot ISO. Um, and this will just start VirtualBox. And start this virtual machine that we've just created. Start VM my kernel as a background process. So that make um, doesn't run infinitely while the um, while the uh, virtual machine is running. Okay, so let's say make run. Oh, wait, this. Uh, <laughs> the operating system was named my operating system. Okay, now here it is. Okay, um, one problem we have now is if we try to run it again while it's still running, we get an error message. So um, if the operating system is already running when we start uh, make run, we should uh, uh, we should force termination of the old version before starting a new one. So I'll say kill. All virtual box. Um, now, if no virtual box is running at this point, then kill all will return an error message, and then make will just not proceed starting a new one. So uh, I just put or true here. Um, it's a bit hackish, but it works. Um, now another problem we have is um, kill all isn't fast enough. So um, when we say kill all virtual box, 
and start a new one, then the new one will be started before everything is cleaned up from the old one. So, um, um, yeah, we should just wait a little. So I'll just say sleep one. Okay, so now I say make run. Here it is. And if I say make run again, the old one disappears and here's a new one. Okay, so this is uh, really handy to have this. Uh, so you can just make changes and say make run and uh, make takes care of everything. Um, so this works really beautifully. Um, now in the next video, um, I want to talk about communicating with the uh, hardware. And this is really a difficult thing. And when you communicate with hardware, everything needs to be byte perfect. I mean, I mean, let's say this is your RAM. And say you have two different parts of your program. Um, and uh, maybe this one expects an int. So, and, and this one creates an int which it passes to the other one. Then, um, well, maybe it's a 16-bit int. Um, so this is written here. And then this uh, takes it from here and everything's fine, okay? Now, if, if we uh, compile both of these parts with the same compiler, um, we don't have to care if this is a 16-bit int or maybe a 32-bit int or whatever. Int is int and we are happy, okay? But uh, when we communicate with hardware, everything needs to be byte perfect. We need to know exactly how many bytes are there and where are they. Uh, where are they. Uh, we need to be really precise, okay? So, um, for example, um, I had this, um, here the, um, the multi-boot magic number. Um, this is an unsigned int at this point. And this works, but we are communicating with a part that is written in assembler. And, well, the assembler code is written so that it will always give us four bytes. And if we compile this kernel CPP now with something that, with, with a compiler that thinks, well, unsigned int is eight bytes, then we'll have a problem. Okay? So, um, what we will do now, and this is really common practice, is, uh, we will create another file, types.h. with the usual protection. And now we will have just uh, some type devs. Um, so we'll have uh, a single character as int 8t. So this is a, an 8-bit integer. Unsigned char is going to be an uint 8t. Short is int 16, unsigned short is int 16, uint 16, int is int 32, unsigned int is uint 32. And long, long 
int is int 64. Okay, so um, so now we will just use um, these types all the time, so that uh, if we are um, running this on a compiler which um, thinks uh, differently, which thinks for which thinks for example, an int is sixty four, then we will just have to change this types dot h, and everything else will just be fine. Okay, so. Um, in the kernel CPP, I'm just uh, saying uint 32t now. And this isn't unsigned short, it's uh, uint 16t now. Uh, okay, we should uh, maybe <laughs> include the file. Okay, now everything runs again. So, um, yeah, this should be sufficient for now. Um, and, uh, well, tune in next time. Um, next time we will start talking about communicating with the hardware, you know, for example, uh, getting data from uh, the keyboard. Um, but let me tell you right now, this is not much fun. It's quite difficult because, uh, yeah, you need to set up a lot of uh, boring things in between. So, uh, but once you have gotten that to work, uh, everything after that becomes relatively easy. So, once you can communicate with uh, the keyboard, you can also very easily communicate with the mouse, and uh, well, everything else uh, follows from that. Okay, so see you next time.